the bridge between a design and reality is the money. Welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with one half of Sydney-based international award-winning design studio, Papas Alexio. I'm talking with Charles Alexio. So having trained originally in nuclear physics and applied mathematics, Charles had a former career in investment banking and software design. Charles then changed career, becoming an interior designer, and he started up his first firm in 1990. Then, with the return of his architect cousin Lam Papas to Australia, this saw the beginning of Papas Alexio, which was in 2016. Their practice works across sectors, private homes and apartments, residential developments, retail showrooms, corporate workspaces, hospitality projects and hotels. And one of the main focuses in this conversation is on the remarkable business innovation that is MCM Homes, uh, which provides a vertically integrated suite of services that are cost effective and they provide affordable design solutions um, for their prospective clients. I was very excited by this approach as it really demonstrated a very deep and unique understanding of some of the prospective clients problems it was solving housing issues in australia um it was understanding that actually for a client who wants a new home the ease of financing isn't always straightforward and actually being able to provide essentially um, a ready-made design that was kind of made to measure if you like um, made it a lot easier for clients to be able to um, predict costs and be able to get financing from their institutions. And the new business model, because it was so tidy and well packaged and very thoughtful, actually ended up changing the way that they were offering and executing their traditional services in Papas Alexio. So sit back, relax and enjoy Charles Alexio. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Charles, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Very well, thank you, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. So you have been very gracious and stayed up very late in the night. You are based in in Sydney, in Australia. So it's kind of, you're entering in tomorrow already. You are the founder um, and principal, or co-founder and principal of both Papas Alexio and MCM Homes, and we'll talk about MCM Homes a little bit later today, but you've been running a practice in Sydney. You've got specialisations in, you've got an incredible portfolio of of residential work, and I know that that's been part of the foundation, or that experience has been part of the foundation of of bringing up MCM Homes. And you work with your business partner, Lam, Lam Papas, and how long have you got? So when, when, when did you set up Papas Alexio? We set Papas Alexio up probably about eight years ago. Right. Lam is uh, an architect from Europe. And I'm a interior designer from Australia. Mm-hmm. And we got together. <laughs> and um, we created Papas Alexio Design Studio. Um, both of us have there's a common thread there. First of all, Lam and I are related. His mother is my cousin. Great. So his grandmother and my mother were sisters. Uh, and so, so, so you're and technic- we're both born technically his uncle. In... Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's, that's, what, that's, uh, that's what we so, say in my family with, with the cousins like that. Yes, yes, yes. Well, or it's, you know, first cousin once removed. Yeah, okay. Um, if you want to be more specific. Yes, yeah. But if yeah. there's a, 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 a disjoint in a generation, then it, you're an uncle. Yes, you're yeah. absolutely right. And we were both born in Darwin in the Northern Territory, which is real sort of out that territory, you know, Crocodile Dundee Territory. <laughs> 
Uh, and uh, uh, he, although I am his uncle, in inverted commas, uh, we're only about five or six year difference in age. Great. So, so, so a close so relationship. The same generation. Got it. Yes, Great. Yes, 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 yes. I was going to say, and, and post um, Cyclone Tracy in Darwin, um, and that was Christmas, Christmas Day, 1974, where there was a big cyclone and literally flattened the city. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when our families went in different directions and we lost contact with each other for a while. Uh, his family decided to go back and settle in Greece, back to Greece, whereas my parents decided to stay and rebuild. Uh, and then we sort of, but we've kept in contact over the years. Great. And so we, so did, Lam was trained in architecture in Greece and later on Correct. kind of returned Correct. to Australia? Yes. Uh, look, look, the thing was he, he, he went back to Greece when he was five or six years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he, all his education was, was done in Greece. The beauty about um, which he had no control over, um, and it was that he, uh, being born in Australia, he had an Australian passport. So coming back was never an issue or a problem. And about seven or eight years ago, things were very, very challenging mm-hmm. in Europe. Um, yes. You know, the economy wasn't doing great. Yeah, Greece was a very, uh, very difficult time. Greece went through a very, very difficult time. Uh, they There were a lot of challenges. Um, the economy wasn't, wasn't doing great. People weren't paying their bills. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, you may have heard this term, you know, architects are like the canaries down the coal mine. You know, we're the first people to to get the flick or the chop. Um, yeah. And uh, we we're, you know, were just, you know, having a conversation. I said, well, look, you know, people would, people, you know, risk their lives and would kill to come and live in Australia. Um, you know, think about it. Um, you know, you're, you're great at the architecture. I'm good at the interiors. Let's get together and... And um, you know, and, and create something. So you say, oh well, I'll give it a go, but nothing to lose. <laughs> so um, that's where sort of it sort of came together. So they came out for a trip, um, had a look around, got a feel for the place, uh, and um, thought, okay, you know, I could make this work. So he went back, packed up, and came back. Fabulous. And has been here ever since. So you both had quite well established careers before founding the business. And when you mm-hmm. kind of when you so when you started working together, what were some of those early projects? What were the what were the ones that were the that first came in the doors? The the ones that were um, the early the early projects were uh, high end residential. Mm-hmm. Um, my contact base was more in the you know, the, um, the the interiors, high end. My philosophy was. Um, uh, you know, architects are all competing for those few good projects. Um, you know, being you know multi-residential dwellings or high rises or whatever. Um, my philosophy was, well, I don't want to compete with all of these guys. Um, you know, why don't I just focus on not just the new but the existing as well? Mm. And so, so I focus on the interiors. So, um, you know, people are constantly refreshing their apartments or doing something new. So all you really need is a good base number of clients. They refer, they refresh every few years. So you've got that, you know, enough to keep, yeah. you, to keep you busy. Now, it's an interesting business proposition, actually, to have an interior uh, designer and an architect working together. And I'm sure you've come across architects who will often, you know, they, they'll often give their clients interior design services, but we can, you can normally tell when an architect has designed the interiors of a, of a house or a home. What, what, what works really well about this partnership between interior design, you as an interior designer, and then Lam being the architect? And how do you, how do you kind of work together? Um, what does it look like? Well, with residential housing, for example, 
Um, well, first of all, as an interior de designer, you always take your cues from the exterior of the building mm -hmm. or the environment that it's in yep. um, to help you because you don't want to have a epileptic fit every time you walk in and out of the house. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we sort of take our cues from that. Um, and it's really good because when we're designing a home, the, the two come together nicely. They, they complement each other. Um, you, know, you don't want to, you know, have a house that looks like a, you know, a villa out of Tuscany on the outside and, and inside you walk in and it's all sort of, you know, mid-century modern, you know, it's mm -hmm. sort, of, just sort of disjoint. Um, or, or a house where every room is different colour. Yeah. <laughs> you sort of... Yeah. Or the or the classic. Yeah, um, we've got we've yeah, got the Mexican yeah, room and then the Chinese room and then the Parisian room. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So so we don't want any of that. We want sort of some cohesion there and some continuity, uh, so things flow. Mm. And so uh, we're able to, from the very beginning, um, start to design homes with being mindful of the interiors and the exteriors. My philosophy is always to build from the inside out. Right. And the reason for that is because we spend 99% of our time inside the house. Right. Um, and that's what we look and touch and feel and live with every day. Um, but the exterior also needs to complement that and, and, and speak to the interiors mm. uh, and also the environment. So it's a bit, a bit of a balancing act there and and who wins the work do you typically because it's interesting so we'll often see architects you know they'll be working with interior designers and the interior designer brings in the project and then they have an architect likewise it works the other way around how do you f typically find clients find you are they looking for interior services first or are they looking for architectural services first um, more often than not, they're looking for architect, uh, interior design services first. Right. More often than not. Um, uh, and if you look at the trend of uh, architects, um, there are more architects now than we had 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. There are fewer jobs than there were 50 years ago. Yep. Um, in, in the mid in, in the 50s, 1950s and 1960s, uh, here in Australia, something like 60 something percent, 63 percent of all new homes were appoint were architects. Yep. Well, architects would design the homes. Now, now we've got more architects, and it's only five percent of the new housing mm. is is getting um, uh, is being are being designed by architects. So. <laughs> So you can sort of say the disjoint there. I guess as well. Just, uh, you know, things change. Well, I guess as well, um, it's not uncommon that we'll see today clients spending more money on their interior packages than they are spending on the architectural packages. What, what do you typically see as a trend with your, with your clients? Which, which part of the business is, are clients investing more heavily into, the interiors or the architecture? It depends, and um, for example, disproportionately, I think they do spend more on the interiors. Mm -hmm. uh, clients demanding uh, higher quality. Um, they're happy to uh, save and cut costs from the exterior mm -hmm. and replace those materials with similar looking materials. Um, that do the same job, um, but they're not prepared to buy a cheaper sofa. Yeah. Because they sell on that sofa every day. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and, yeah, and it's, it's you know, what you touch and feel and what you use every day that has the big impact on people. Mm -hmm. It's not how the house looks. Um, it's, I mean, that that's part of it because those people that engage interior designers to do the interiors are obviously very house proud, so the exterior is just as important to them, mm -hmm. but the spend is disproportional. Yeah. 
That's very that's very interesting. And does the spend then reflect the fees on services? Uh, yes, it does. With um, the architectural side of the business, um, the fees are fairly straightforward. Um, and to be quite honest with you, there's an awful lot of work that goes into it from an architectural perspective to get a house to a point where it's been approved sure. and with a, for a building permit. Yeah. Um, there's very different, lots of different stages and each one of those stages, and this is the, the travesty here in this country, I don't know what it's like in Europe, but um, here something like 20% of your budget to get it to a building permit is paid out is paid out in you know um, consultants and council fees and this and that just to get rubber stamps and and to to, to get it through it it's not spent on the architectural side of it at all mm. um, so so you know there's there's all the, all this money but you're actually not getting anything tangible for it you're just getting the, the tick. And, and it's got to the point where it's a bit silly now, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I understand that, you know, yes, they need to make sure it's, you know, um, you, know you don't want, you know, uh, people just throwing something together on a, on, a, on a napkin and saying, this is what I want mm -hmm. to counsel and then stamping it. But, you know, they want more than that. But And I know there needs to be some checks and balances to make sure that it's, you know, there's structural integrity there and all those sort of things. But, the fees and charges are so disproportional and what they ask you is so much mm -hmm. to the point where it's actually ridiculous. Yeah. It, it's just silly. Um, and uh, I think that's why a lot of people uh, are not using architects mm. to, to for their projects. They're just going straight to builders and yep. builders are acting as architects. And, and is it that... you don't need an architect. An architect doesn't have to design something for a council to approve it. Yeah. So that's that's very interesting. That's very so similar. They've sort of diminished thing. the value of an architect. Yes. Yeah. That's a very similar thing that we've we've seen here in Europe and in 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 the US as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you manage then clients' expectations around? something like that because obviously you know 20 percent of their budget is going just to get the permits ready and mm. you know for, yeah. for a client they might just be uh, why 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 is this happening and you know you might mm. that's a that's a difficult thing for the consultants to try and safely navigate the client yeah. through if yeah. you like yeah yeah it's um i just want to clarify it's not 20 percent of the total budget or build right it's just twenty percent of the you know, to getting it to the point where they can start building. I see. I um, see. You know what I mean? That that initial stage, which is yep. you know significant, it can be into into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes. If you're not careful. Yeah. Okay. So um, so, so so on that on that account, um, it is a difficult one explaining it to them, but it's. It's a process that, whether we're an architect or whether a builder, whether we're builders or whether a builder is doing the work for them, it's a process that all parties have to go through, mm -hmm. and there's no avoiding those costs. Yeah. Now, if a builder is doing the whole thing, he can quite easily conceal those costs as part of the building cost. And the client wouldn't be in none the wiser, right? Because because they're saying here, okay, for this house, it's going to cost you eight hundred thousand, and they look at the the total figure. I'm just saying it's going to go to the. Um, they don't know that it, the bill, the actual real bill, technically only costs, you know, seventy thousand. Sorry, seven hundred thousand. Hmm. And the other hundred is all the other stuff that the architects will be doing. The only difference is that. The client doesn't see it sees it in 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 a, in a different light, and what I mean by that is they'll see okay eight hundred thousand that that I can I can comprehend that yes but 
to comprehend 100000 and not knowing what it's going to cost me, 100000 before I get anything, is a big ask. Yes. Yeah, I, I get that. I get it's that. It's a big ask. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I might not be explaining myself very well, um, but uh, I think um, you're sort of getting where I'm coming from. And that's where the model that we've engaged MCM homes mm. has has come um, has come into its own, right? Um, which is um, uh, which is very very helpful um, in getting the clients over the line, so to speak. So, so what is MCM Homes? How would you describe it? Uh, MCM Homes is well. Let me tell you how it came about. Okay, and that may help you. About four years ago, we went into a little bit of a lull here in Australia and um, we weren't getting a lot of projects coming through the pipeline. And so, because, you know, the reality is, you know, you're not going to get rich being an architect. Uh, And I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, so, So you have to... You have to be clever and think outside the box and and do utilize your skills and your services and your knowledge to to do something to do something in the field, but that's something unique that other people aren't doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and about four years ago, when things were getting really really tough in the, in the, in our market, we we had a bit of a, a weekend powwow. And it's off the top of power, I get the thinking. Um, it's, um, we had a, a, a serious conversation and uh, we said, okay, where do we go from here? So we, we rattled our brains and we thought, what can we do to that utilizes all our skills, our knowledge, our experience, our resources, our contacts, um, Within the within the industry, and that's where the concept of MCM Homes was born. MCM Homes is um, stands for Mid Century Modern Homes, and it's just a description of the style of homes that we that we design here in Australia. Um, a lot of new Australians buy into uh, estates. Mm-hmm. And these estates are new estates, and uh, new homes get built on these estates. They like new estates um, because everything's new, and you know it's the infrastructure's all new. Things aren't going to break down very, very quickly. But the price they pay for that, it's a little bit further out. Yeah. Um, but but Australia is getting very good at putting in the infrastructure first and foremost to attract those clients. And the infrastructure I'm talking about is not only just the basic infrastructure like you know, roads, water, sewerage, power, internet. I'm talking about um, hospitals, shopping centers, those sort of things. Uh, and uh, a lot of those lots are being divided. A lot of those lots are what I call a stock standard size. Right. So they come with a certain width, for example. So they're either you know, 10 metres by 30 metres or 12 and a half by 30 or 15 by 30. And so what we decided to do is um, take those lot sizes and pre-design a handful of homes in that design, in that style, uh, whereby people can, like, it's like in the 50s and the 60s where people used to buy homes out of the catalogue. Same sort of concept. Um, uh, however, with a little bit more research put into it, mm-hmm. a little bit more thought, and, um, uh, and people knowing what the price is up front. Right. And in that price, we build in our architectural fees. So it is on a success basis, but the client is getting the end product. Um, 
and they have a choice. It's not like a, bes- a totally bespoke product where we're starting totally from scratch and we're doing exactly what they want. Mm-hmm. It's we're giving them options of different designs and they pick the one that's closest to what they like yep. and we can massage that for them. So that takes a lot of the hard work and guesswork out of it for us mm-hmm. uh, as designers because, you know, in, traditionally you sit down with the client, you pick their brains, you try to get into their head, you, know, you try to get information out of them. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. Um, yeah, so there's lots of... Uh, Lots of turns, lots of you know, attempts, yep. and various different things to get it right for the client. Whereas this way, it comes sort of almost ninety percent there. Yeah, you know, they're basically happy with the general layout, and what they also understand is they understand that a certain lot size dictates how big the house can be or the footprint can be. Yeah. Uh, so, so from that, um, and and we can build the architectural fees into that, which is great. Um, there's a end, there's a one fixed price mm-hmm. for the end product, uh, and um, uh, we have a number of different builders that we um, work with, that they that know how we like to do things, uh, and you know we've been working with them for quite a while. So it makes the whole process very smooth and simple because at the end of the day, what these people want is they just want a new home. So finished. Are, so are you managing the build as well then and the construction? No. What we do is we do a high, a high level um, oversight. Right. Just to make sure it's, it's, um, uh, it's, as, as per the plans, but you know, as I said, we've got builders, they've worked with us for years, they know what we want, they understand uh, things. So uh, it just, it also streams like, streamlines it for them as well. Mm. And it makes life really easy for them because they know, okay, I know what they want. Um, uh, so, so that gives us a win because, first of all, um, uh, the client is really happy because they get what they want. We're happy because we're getting our architectural fees without all that effort of designing from totally scratch. Yeah. Um, and and uh, uh, the the most important part of this whole this exercise is that instead of the client having to come up with, and I'm going to take you back to the analogy of the. Eight hundred thousand dollar build and the hundred thousand dollar cost to to get it to the building stage. Mm-hmm. Um, the client doesn't have to find that hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is in the architectural fees out of their own pocket. It's actually built in to the mortgage. Ah, so they will go to the bank. Right. You see? So well, that's very they go to the bank and they say, we want to buy this house. To, yeah. So they will want to go to the, um, So we've thought this through very, very well. We want to build this house. Um, the bank will say, okay, well, you know, you want to borrow X amount. Um, you know, they'll, they'll work out what their borrowing capacity and do all that sort of stuff. And they'll say, well, you need to put a, uh, you know, a 10% deposit down. Um uh, or a five percent deposit, as it is here now. So, so it gets all those fees get incorporated into the into the um, the, the loan facility, hmm. and so the client doesn't feel the pain. Um, <clears throat> and that that seems to work really well for us. Right. So it's diff- So it's much more difficult for a client to be able to get a mortgage for the front end design work of a house than it is if it's kind of packaged as an all-in-one product. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're not, no one's going to lend them money yeah. to get a, a design done. Yeah. You know, they're going to say, I'm sorry, you know, you've got to point it out of your own pocket. So yeah. to save that money and have that money to design it is, 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 is difficult. But 
again, you have to offer people viable options. Yeah. You, know, you can't just offer them one option for one block of land. And what we've done is we've co covered all our bases and we even offer them, um, you know, uh, for example, the, the big ticket item is uh, choosing the footprint or the layout within that footprint. Mm -hmm. Once that's done, the rest is fairly simple. So yep. what we do is we sit down with the client then and we uh, design the facade with them. Mm -hmm. So they feel they have a say in it. Yep. Um, and and uh, so therefore then what we're doing is we're presenting a bespoke, we're producing a bespoke product. Yeah. And we start the facade process with the roof line, which can be, you know, either a, a flat roof or a, or a um, skittering roof or an A-frame or a butterfly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and then the rest is just sort of dressing, you know. And we, and we have a few uh, ingredients, if you want to call it that, or L, um, uh, that we, materials that we use, and we mix and match those as to the client's liking with our architect mm -hmm. um, and the various different and, and colours. And as far as the interiors are, and sorry, um, and then the client is happy because they're getting something that they want. Yeah. Um, but we've taken away out all that drudgery in the front, front end of that process by giving them something that's half baked. Yeah. Or ninety percent baked, I should say. Yeah, because the big the big ticket item is always, you know, the footprint, and the footprint is, you know, how much you're allowed to build on that land, the easements, the setbacks, all those sort of things that clients don't drink, think about. They don't yep. think about that. They just say, I want a four bedroom house. You know, I want three bathrooms. I want double car garage. You know, that's what they think. They don't think, okay, where am I going to put all these things? Um, that's our job to do that. But by taking all that out of the equation, it's a very quick and simple mm -hmm. process. It's almost like a sausage factory <laughs> yeah. without it being a sausage factory. It's very, it's very uh, clever. And, yeah, and the inside, from the interior perspective, we offer, we offer them a, couple, a few different color schemes. Mm -hmm. No different to, say, buying an apartment off the plan. Yeah. You go and you'll see something and that there's a display room or display suite somewhere and, you know, these are the fixtures and fittings. You can have this version or you can have that scheme. You know, you can have, you know, black marble or you can have white marble with veins through it. You know, it's – we make it as, you know, as, uh, uh, as engaging as we possibly can to make the client – uh, feels that they're getting mm. what they want. And, I, and you know, all our clients have been thrilled and happy with the end product. Did, did you choose... And if they need any further assistance, yeah. we, we can take it one level further. You know, so if they want, um, you know, uh, out, outdoor, um, you know, um, uh, festoon lighting mm -hmm. in the courtyard... You know, those sort of party lights yeah. that you see in bars and things like that, or if they want an outdoor sound system, or if they want, you know, we do all of that for them. Um, at, and, and we decide all that at the beginning, so it all gets built into the price mm. and what they go to the bank asking for. Uh, so essentially our service is a full turnkey service. Yeah. So essentially the day they get the key, they can literally just move the furniture in and they're home. What What about the, the, the lawn the, is in? The, what about the price of the land? Do they have Do they have to buy the land separately and then come to you, or does that was that wrapped yes, up in it yes, as well? Yes, yes, yes. Well, we can wrap the two up together, right? Or if they've got the land, we can just do the house for them. Ah, oh, very, very. I like this. Very, very nice model. And I love this the the way that you you know you've kind of really solved a difficult problem there for the client in terms of financing, because by having it as a vertically integrated offer, 
it's much easier for them to approach the bank with something concrete as opposed to something mm. much more speculative that they don't know how much it's going to cost even when they've got the sort of out you know the beginnings of a design for it um the way that you were describing how you're able to allow the clients to kind of have this experience of designing the home themselves so they can choose the roofs they can you know sit and design the the outside uh, area with you they can choose colors did you choose mid-century modern housing as an architectural language because it allowed you to do that or were there other reasons um look primarily well, well first of all and this is actually a really interesting I th- we can talk about this for hours um uh, ryan it's a interesting philosophical question as mm. well uh or discussion um you know here uh, australia relies on um, migration to for population growth right and if you want the economy to grow you need population growth mm-hmm. um, and you know, every so often there's a new type of wave of migrant type of migrant you know, in the 50s and the 60s we had the Greeks and the Italians then shortly after that, we had the Vietnamese, you know, because mm-hmm. of the Vietnamese War. Then shortly after that, you know, had a different, uh, uh, the Lebanese. Mm-hmm. Then we've got, um, uh, you know, more recently now, we had uh, African, mm-hmm. uh, from, the, from, from the African content. Um, so there's, there's sort of different waves of generations. And, and <clears throat> there's always been this, and I know it's very, it's very politicized that, Oh, you know, and you know, one side of politics will always pull pull this out. You know, they always try it on. Yeah. Um, And I say, oh, you know, they're not integrating into the society. Sure. And you know, and you know, all all those stupid arguments. And and you know, all the homes that we are building are your traditional. Boxes, I call them. Mm-hmm. Just a box with a roof and small windows and doors. There's no connection to the outside world. Yep. Per se. It's very inward looking, mm-hmm. not outward looking. And because you're inward looking, you have a tendency to view the world in a certain way. Um, and this is what we do we, we put our migrants into these little boxes. Yeah. That, whereas I'm just trying to turn it around, and if we had architecture or design style that impacted on them and made them more outward looking, Mm -hmm. then I think uh, you you would interact with your neighbor more often. You would say hello over the fence. You know, you'd. There's, you know, there's that sort of thing where we've got everyone sort of, everyone, everyone is like in their own little cubicles mm-hmm. and no one seems to be socializing or interacting or connecting. Um, and so mid century modern was the obvious design style um, for me. Um, uh, and the reason for that is because, well, I'm old enough to remember what that sort of design looked and felt like. Yeah. Uh, growing up, and the beauty about it is the new, the next generation or the generation that's now buying their homes don't remember it at all. <laughs> so to them, it's something new and wonderful. Mm-hmm. But it's the whole philosophy of mid-century modern that appeals to me, which was, you know, it, it was born shortly after the Second World War, the first time that the world was at peace. Uh, it, there was a the era of optimism, yeah, and pep- and design was reflecting that. All of a sudden, you know, the openings became bigger. We had sort of that seamless indoor outdoor living uh, arrangement. Uh, those sort of things, you know, bringing the gardens inside. You know, I'm sure you will remember growing up. You know, everyone had if there was an internal staircase. Under the staircase was always a little garden, you know, of indoor plants. So. 
it was just like these little things that all sort of impact on our state of mind. Yeah. And I think for for a healthier outlook on life, mm-hmm. that you know, you could do anything. Um, whereas now we're sort of putting people in shackles, mm-hmm. um, psychologically speaking, um, and we're wondering, you know, why aren't they X, Y, Z? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing is also, um, and this is really important, uh, Ryan, to discuss, but it's very topical, and that is um, uh, the environment mm-hmm. and the cost of uh, uh, uh Cooling a house and warming a house in winter, and and so the less we are, we can be reliant on uh, on fossil fuels, um, the better for the hip pocket and the environment. Uh, you know, the eighties was a year, so it was a decade where you know that the later part of last century, the eighties and the nineties. It was that era of you know Wall Street and you know greed is good and everyone was making a shitload of money and houses were getting bigger. Everyone yeah. was wanting to, to live in a big back mansion, um, you know, five bedrooms. They had one or two children, but they wanted five bedrooms. Mm-hmm. It had to be two stories, you know, and and you know I think to myself, you know, and they would have to pay all this money out just to heat the home in winter. Uh, this huge volume. That only two or three people used, and what I love about um, mid-century modern is it was also a passive solar design. So depending on how the house was orientated, and having um, you know an indoor courtyard that allowed the light and the sun to come in and warm the house from mm-hmm. the inside out, uh, uh, capturing the prevailing winds flow through in summer to get that nice breeze, all those things have, were forgotten. Yeah. <clears throat> and so what we're doing is we're just, you know, own little little way, we're just introducing those elements back into design. And then the, the elements that have been pushed to the side because of cost. Mm. No other reason. You know, oh, it's too expensive to, you know, to break the roof. You know, like I said, you've got this huge box with a roof on it, well, yeah, and you expect in the middle of that box to get light, natural light in. Of course, you're not. <laughs> um, so, so I think I think um, so. So there are a lot of elements that came into play that drew us to to mid-century modern design. Very interesting. H- have you philosophy? F- have you have you found then that mass house builders or developers have been interested in buying these services from you? So, that, so for example, they've they've kind of bought 16, 20 lots at a go, and then they've gone right, guys, we want to have thirty of these, twenty of these houses on these plots. We are getting the attention of some of them, right? Which is good. Mm-hmm. A lot of these estates also come with. Uh, a design guide and a lot of those design guides are drawn up by um, the developer and his his choice of style Mm -hmm. Um, but they're also very much influenced by councils sure and um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to work within the council guidelines to create something different, but that ticks all the boxes. Mm-hmm. Um, but in doing so, we're also starting to show count show councils that um, these options are actually to their benefit and actually helping them achieve their their goals and objectives as well. Because um, yeah, they're all for you know for greener, for more outdoor space, for more mm-hmm. blah 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 blah. But they're just doing it the wrong way, I believe. Um, it's not a; it, it's more a, a stick approach as opposed to a carrot approach. <laughs> Got it. And 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 these these development yeah. sites yeah. By are they, imposing are they... rules on people. Got it. And these development sites, then, are they 
uh, I'm, I'm guessing they're not in the middle of Sydney, typically, and that they're in more kind of suburban areas. Mm. I know Sydney is enormous, and it kind of just sort of spreads out for. Yeah, yeah, we're we're we're, we're a very low rise city. Yeah, um, with central business CBD districts. Yeah, um, I guess no different to London, I would imagine, where it's sort of mostly yeah you know, low rise urban sprawl. Yeah, um, and with the yeah you know, the centre of the city is where the high rises are. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, typically they they are about you know forty minutes, fifty minute drive from mm-hmm. the city, which I don't know if that is um, a long way for you guys, but it certainly is for us. It's like you know to drive. And you know, almost an hour in one direction and an hour back. If you worked in the city, yeah, but sure. What? But these these estates are becoming very popular mm-hmm. um, because you know, for a number of different reasons. But most of all, they're becoming popular because, apart from that, the, the, they're affordable. The one good thing that's come out of COVID is that working from home is now perfectly acceptable. Mm-hmm. And Zoom meetings like this um, uh, are okay, whereas um, before, you know, bosses were very, you know, sort of control freaks, yeah. um, <laughs> and they didn't think that or trusted that their employees would would work and they just sleep all day or I don't know do whatever. Um, but what COVID has done is it's forced the situation. And it's demonstrated to the um, the corporations uh, and the employers that the productivity actually went up, not down. It actually went up. Right. So, so that so all of a sudden now they're starting to become more comfortable with that concept. And as more and more people are working from home, living in those areas is 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 acceptable. And, and people like it because it's fresh air, you know, mm. it's, um, uh, it's you know, everything's new. There's lovely new gardens, there's hospitals, there's schools, there's playgrounds for the kids. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. It, it, is, it is like a little um, you know, oasis. Um, uh, and you, know, you must not forget the type of people that wish to live there you know, have come from, you know, pretty horrible, you know, um, circumstances, you know, well, um, it's, uh, you know, you know um, escaping wars and so forth. What was the um, impetus? So, uh, MCM Homes is a, is a separate business from the architectural interior design firm. From what was the reason for separating the two and making two independent businesses, as opposed to having this? home design or this vertically integrated home design just as another service, if you like, of Papa Selexio? Look, essentially it is another service of Papa Selexio, um, but it also has its own identity and flavour. Yep. Which is the mid-century modern element. Mm-hmm. I didn't want Papas Alexia to be just mid-century modern. Sure. Okay. Um, so, so what we've done is, you know, we've we've created MCM Home, which is which is um, doing really well, and um, it also allows us to filter those people that are looking for a home to put in their block of land. And those people that want something a little bit more serious, that have experience and knowledge working with architects, so we can focus on those clients more in a different way and give the other clients without the budget what they want without doing them a disservice. Mm -hmm. Has the MCM Homes business model, if you like, has it influenced the way that you deal with some of the real bespoke work that you're doing with with those kind of ultra high net worth type of individuals has it ref, has it refined those processes or is it, what kind of influence has it had 
look, it's, it's a good question. Um, I don't think it's really changed much in the process. Mm. It's just changed how we present things to them in a slightly different way. Mm. Um, instead of starting with a blank canvas, we, we start with a point of reference, a starting point. Mm-hmm. Um, because when you start with a blank canvas, there are no boundaries, there are no parameters, there's no, you know, like you can do whatever you want. And that's where they get into trouble because um, uh, they may say to you, look, I want, 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 want this, 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 this. And, you know, it doesn't matter how much money they have. Mm -hmm. It's how much they're prepared to part with or spend on the project. I'm not saying in architectural fees. I'm just saying on the project. Yeah. So there's a real differentiation there. Um, So with, with, so just because someone has got a lot of money doesn't mean they're prepared to spend whatever it takes to create that. Those sort of clients are very few and far between and rare. Yes. So so what we do, like we do with MCM Homes, is we start with their budget. Where's your budget? What mm-hmm. house can you afford? Yeah. This one or this one. So, so we're able to implement some of those, those up front Mm-hmm. So we have our, in our own mind, what you know, where, what they're prepared to spend, and I find that that's a really good starting point for us. It's not an easy question for them to answer, mm. but um, we sort of insist on that because there's nothing more soul destroying and discouraging for the client is if. We design something that's not to a specific budget because they want it. I want this, I want that. Like kids in a lolly shop, you know, I want this, I want this, I want this. You design it all, then you put it out for tender and it comes back and it's like, oh, (laughs) holy moly. You know, I wasn't prepared to spend that much. Yeah. So it's, it's so destroying for us that we've done all this work and so forth. Not so much because we've done the work, because then we get paid for it, but mm-hmm. it's because we've done the work, but it's not going to see the light of day. Mm-hmm. The bridge between a design and reality is the money. Yep. If you don't have the budget, it doesn't become reality. Mm-hmm. So, so that's what we're now focusing on. And that's what MCM Homes and that model has taught us. That's brilliant. In, for Papus Alexia. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Uh, and the other thing is also, um, it's also allowed us to to weed or, you know, pick the wood, look at the wood from the trees. Yeah. Um, so we're able to, to separate the two. And so what it actually does is, and, and now what we do with Papus Alexia, we say, look, we will only take on a handful of clients every year. We can only manage a handful of clients at any one particular point in time. So it actually creates a sort of pipeline and a sort of feeling of exclusivity and value for money mm-hmm. where something that you know, um, previously wasn't achieving. And what we have is we'll have people prepared to wait. So that's a really good thing because, you know, if they're prepared to wait, then their their perception of us is higher. Yeah, worthwhile, <laughs> worth waiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. Love um, it. So that's what it's allowed us to do. Whereas before, throwing everyone in the mix was like, okay, well, what 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 one of these? Which one's this one? You know, and having to start from scratch every time was was um you know really time consuming mm-hmm. uh and 
it's not just a matter of time consuming for us, from us, but you know, when when clients want something, particularly, you know, people want want a house, they want to build their house, they want to get started quickly. You know, they don't want to stuff around with approval processes and this and that and um, so what we're able to do is, you know, there are certain mechanisms and tools in place here whereby we can, you know, they've chosen the, pla- the house. It doesn't take very long because we're giving them multiple options uh, to choose from for that particular size block of land. Mm-hmm. Uh, we sit with them. We can get it into council um, and approved within, with, within a month. And so that, that helps that... Um, the momentum, mm-hmm. whereas you know the other way, it's it's lots of to- toing and proing, toing and proing, toing and proing, and you still don't know if you're going to get <laughs> get what you're designing through through council or not. Uh, and um, uh, and the other layer of complication was we didn't know if the client could afford it, but we're dealing with that now upfront, Fantastic. and that's the big takeaway I think. Uh, that's brilliant. That, that's that's such a interesting insight from the MCM home model and kind of how it's kind of started you to reevaluate how you're presenting ideas and expectations, really, like how you're managing a client's expectations from the very get go. And you're not having to deal with that, you know, that quite deflating experience of putting in the hard work, getting it pushed back from the contractors, mm-hmm. particularly now when we've got these, you know, this supply chain issues and it's just sort of magnified that aspect of it. And then clients come back and they're like, how is it so over budget? And then you've got to charge them again for the redesign. And then that creates more tension in the relationship. Mm-hmm. So yeah, brilliant. And the other thing that we also um, do is, the the price that we provide them that our builder provides them mm-hmm. is a fixed price contract, right? So so if if the it's a it's a fixed price. If the builder um, if prices go up, it's it's on his head. Mm-hmm. So the client knows what he's up for, and it's really important um, because it gives them peace of mind. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no reason why any builder can't procure uh, materials from the set go. Yep. They don't have to take delivery of them, but they can procure them. Mm-hmm. So they know that they're sitting in the warehouse waiting for them when they're ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the moment the contract's signed, there's no reason why they can't do that. Yep. And so what we do is we make sure those elements are all in place to, to allow for a, for a smooth... Um, building process without those stops and starts and stops and starts mm-hmm. because a smooth building process means pure costs or expenses uh, or um, and higher profit margins for the builder the quicker the builder does it the better he is you know, t- you know say time is money and our biggest cost in this industry is labor you can keep the labor costs down or the labors on site down then you there's a big part of your budget taken yep. care of already. Yeah. Fantastic. Brilliant. Charles, that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation now. That was a real masterclass in client expectation and a fabulous, <laughs> a fabulous uh, innovation of the way that you've kind of created a vertically integrated design service that's, you know, number one, accessible, affordable, getting to the right, getting to the right people plus a very, you know, a, a decent and profitable business model, which has impacted the way that you're more... And fundable, to. fundable by, by clients. Yeah. Yeah, then being able to take the, the full price to the bank and say, this is what we want. Brilliant. And show the bank, you know, floor plans and, you know, 3D visualizations, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and, you know, the bank just basically stamps it and says yes. <laughs> Love it. Brilliant. Charles, well, thank you very much for staying up so late this evening. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. And uh, for sharing that expertise. 
And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.